Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech, the nine o'clock block on a given Monday. And uh, to make that Tuesday, it's Tuesday. And uh, we're talking uh, in community matters here about drone reforestation with the CEO of Drone Seed, uh, Grant Canary. Uh, welcome to the show, Grant. Nice to have you here. Hello, hello. It's a pleasure. So um, you're really exciting to find out what you're doing. It's the perfect time and place for it, given climate change and, of course, the wildfires. Uh, we need to reforest. Um, we just finished making a movie on Think Tech about how um, deforestation, reforestation, critical to dealing with climate change. Um, and so uh, you, you, you come to us at, at the perfect time for the discussion. And I think you come to the world at the perfect time, um, the greatest need we've ever seen for reforestation. And, and also the perfect time to find that technology can help. So um, you're, you're into the drone side of things and you've acquired Silverseed, uh, which is into the seedling side of things. And so it's a perfect marriage too. Can you talk about the marriage? Um, what does that mean to you? What does it mean to Silverseed? What does it mean to reforestation? Absolutely. Um, so Silverseed, uh, they're a 130 year old business. Uh, they are the stewards of one of the largest private seed banks on the West Coast. So for customers who have been impacted by fires, land managers, these tribal nations, small family forests, timber companies, state, state and federal agencies, nonprofits, uh, impacted by fire, they need four things. Uh, seed, which is number one, which is one of the biggest uh, parts of the silver seed business, uh, seedlings. Um, in uh, a number of cases, uh, enhanced aerial seeding. The terrain is incredibly difficult. Uh, so utilizing drones, uh, putting the seed in vessels that boost the survival rate uh, is incredibly helpful to be able to reforest faster. Uh, and then finance. And that's where we finance utilizing carbon credit uh, projects. So we are a vertically integrated uh, business now, and we can plug a customer into any one of those four things or all of those four things to help reforest faster after wildfires, which is where we exclusively work. Who are the customers? Yeah, um, we work with uh, so the, the tribal nations, uh, land managers that are uh, small family forests, state and federal agencies, um, and then um, I'm leaving on timber companies. So those are kind of some of the, the basics of, these are the buckets in which land managers fall into. Um, and they're the ones who, as soon as that fire goes through and they're looking at kind of what, what, what are my next steps? That's where we, that's where we get involved and speak with folks. And then in addition to that, there's a whole plethora of, um, consultants in the forestry space, registered professional foresters, uh, and others that those land managers reach out to. And we have programs that are available to them to help get uh, people uh, reforestation faster. And the, one of the biggest obstacles there is if you're a small family forest and you have a couple of acres, um, is, is getting access to seed growing space. There's not enough nursery capacity and there's not enough seed out there. And that's one of the most interesting things about the business is that uh, that has been something that has now been invested in for a uh, really significant time. It's been a compliance cost. So what we're doing with Silva Seed is doubling the production um, of both seed, seedlings and seed collection. So being able to work with professional foresters, have them sort of group neighbors together, come to us and then say, great, like here's, here's our order, got significant size. We can work with that. And we've got uh, relationships with various uh, professional foresters that can assist there. Are you all over the country? Are you beyond the country? How, you know, what's the geographic area of your operations? Yeah, so we are in the Pacific Northwest and California is where we're operating today. So Oregon, Washington, Idaho, California. Um, on the FAA side, we're the first and only that's approved for heavy lift aircraft. Um, operating in swarms of up to five aircraft at a time, controlled by a pilot and an operator at the computer. And so uh, we are, under the FAA, approved in every state west of Colorado. Um, and that's been a, a multi-year process to get those approvals due to the size and weight of the aircraft, as well as them being operated by a single pilot. Have, have you got competition? Uh, is there anybody else be, you know, uh, chasing you into this space, so to speak? Um, 
make a lot of money doing same something and there's always going to be people that uh, follow you. Um, that is our goal. That is why we chose uh, for profit is to really send as many people into the space as possible by setting the example. We are the industry leader. Um, there's nobody else that's FAA approved in the United States to operate like this um, and uh, to our knowledge in Canada as well. So those are our primary areas of operations. We also have projects uh, ongoing in New Zealand and also uh, taking a look at Australia. So um, that's kind of where our geographic footprint is today. Boy, that's exciting. I'm, I'm really delighted to talk to you on many levels. So um, I, what I get is that you take you take a seed, like a, maybe a, 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 a kind of an acorn kind of tree seed and you plant it and you have a seedling and the seedling is a certain size and then you put the seedling in this in this vessel, um, which I recall from your materials is up to 57 pounds. Um, and then you have a certain way of dispatching um, the, the seedlings in that vessel, along with, uh, you mentioned, a, a swarm of five vessels. And so you can cover a certain amount of uh, geography that way fairly quickly. So the question is, um, uh, can't you just drop the acorns? How big does the seedling have to be to be effective? Yeah, so so we're taking uh, like pine cones. So if anybody's ever had a pine cone fight with a sibling or friends in the neighborhood or whatnot, like that's what we're utilizing. And as you'll know, like there's pine cones that are both open and those are the ones that are sort of light and airy. They fly through the air slowly. And then there's ones that are closed, which are super hard and they hurt. Um, and so we're utilizing that. If you cut open one of those that's uh, hard, you can actually see the seeds inside of that pine cone. Um, and so what we're doing is we gather up uh, bushels, which are just big burlap bags of these seeds, and then we run them through our process to break apart the cone, collect the seed. Our business is the intersection of um, tech and hardware, uh, software, uh, the biology. And so it's been fascinating for some of us to come from different areas of the business, learn about the other areas and go, oh, wow, that's phenomenal. Uh, that's very cool. You know, it's very cool to, to learn these things in the process. So we take those seeds um, and then as you're describing, we put them into a seed vessel. So it's about the size of a hockey puck. We put multiple seeds per vessel and the entire focus of the vessel is to boost the seed establishment rate. So this is what tree planters have been doing for a long time with one to two year old trees grown in a nursery is you take them out to site and put them in what's called a, a micro site where it's uh, next to a stump or it uh, is in a little bit of a, of a gully or a ditch that's a couple of feet wide. It has a little bit less sun exposure. It may have collect a little bit more moisture, et cetera. And that helps it survive. Well, what I would describe the seed vessel is, is a bit of like a nano site. It's about the size of a hockey puck. So it's not, uh, it's not a couple feet wide or anything else along those lines. And its whole purpose is to help the seed have a higher establishment rate than what raw seed would have otherwise. And the two things that really kill seeds out there are desiccation, drying out, and getting eaten by predators, so squirrels, mice, birds. Um, when, you know, if you just drop a whole bunch of raw seed, you could create a squirrel buffet if you're not careful. So we involve a couple of ingredients. Um, one of them we've disclosed on the Mark Rover video, which is um, super spicy pepper, which deters uh, squirrels and rodents. Um, it's not perfect, um, but it is something that is acts as a big deterrent. And that is the whole purpose is boost the probability. It's a probability game uh, as far as in that survival and that establishment of the, of the seed. Um, and so, and then because seed is so scarce, as we've seen with the Wired article and the Fast Company article, uh, being able to um, minimize the use of the seed across the landscape is really helpful. And so that's the purpose of the seed vessels. Um, and then putting them in the aircraft, um, we, we fly five drones at a time. And so they carry 57 pounds of these hockey pucks or seed vessels, uh, and then they're dropping them. So we don't fire them into the ground. Uh, or anything along those lines. We started there. We looked at that as an as a potential approach and how we would um, work with the uh, seed vessels and try and get them embedded into the ground. And we just ultimately decided that there was a much simpler and easier to do, which was to put the seed into the vessel, drop the vessel, and it's already kind of a couple of millimeters down into the vessel. So it's acting as if it has been buried already. What's the vessel made out of? We don't disclose that, uh, unfortunately. That's a little bit of our secret sauce. Well, my yeah, and, and my success is that I reached 
something that's proprietary. I'm happy that you said no. <laughs> I, I know I know I'm asking you good questions <laughs> when you tell me it's proprietary. Uh, okay, well, so uh, this is really, really interesting. So the, uh, the it sounds to me, I was thinking that the swarm arrangement would be like on a grid, you know, like on a search pattern, uh, where you take a given piece of geography, divide it up into, say, squares or rectangles, and then you have the, you know, the drones fly uh, over these squares or rectangles. But you have much greater control than that. You can focus it down to a very small area and really pound that area in order to be sure that you're going to have tree growth in that area. How does that work? Yep. Um, so uh, what we do is we basically do a first flight where we fly a drone that has a LiDAR unit, a multispectral camera, and that LiDAR unit is taking about 800,000 uh, points per second. So a little laser bouncing off of a two-inch tree branch. It's important to collect those uh, returns, uh, those uh, sort of dots in the cloud, because it creates a whole 3D terrain map. So we don't send our drone right into that tree branch. Um, it is uh, significantly higher resolution than even self-driving cars. It's something that we look at as far as like, how do we create that, that landscape and that map? So then we run our software on top of that, and then that generates the flight paths that we want to uh, fly the drones along. And uh, what we do is today, we manually remove a lot of the acreage in which we don't believe the sea vessels would uh, grow well. So this is incredibly simple things for human. You're like, well, we shouldn't dump, we shouldn't dump a whole bunch of sea vessels on a gravel road. It's it's not going to do well. But if for a computer, you're like running, you're looking at that, and you're like, okay, great, let's remove all of these areas. This is all blackberry bushes. Uh, this is this is existing stands of trees that are uh, 20 to 40 feet tall. So the shade they're going to be quite shaded, so they're not going to get growth. So this is how we sort of analyze at about a third of an acre scale. And then we can actually uh, get the seed vessel within a meter to two meters as far as uh, where we drop the where we drop and where it lands. And so that's something that we can microsite very similar to those tree planters I mentioned. Um, and then uh, to the earlier question about uh, kind of the the proprietary nature, what I can say is that uh, we published our results uh, from our first two years. We have about a year to two years delay where we reward our customers who are working on projects with us. Um, but we published our result in the U.S. Forest Service uh, tree planters notes. Um, and so that is publicly available for folks that want to take a look at that. So I can see you sitting down with, say, some organization that owns land and manages land, wants to reforest, um, and, they, and they show you a map, um, and then you punch it in uh, on a GPS basis, and now you know exactly where you, you want to drop, how much seed, what kind of seed. Um, and what time and day and so forth. And, and you take pictures of what you do right down to those very fine, fine resolution pictures. And then uh, you report back to your client and say, well, here's what we did. Here's uh, the amount of seed we dropped. Here's the locations we dropped it. Here's some, uh, some video of uh, how, you know, uh, what it looks like. And, and um, what about following up though, Grant? What about going back there a month or two or six months later to see how it's doing or a year or two? Uh, do you do that too for the client? Oh, absolutely. So the level of data that we're providing providing to customers is unprecedented, meaning that previously there are a whole bunch of seedlings they would go out and kind of which species got planted where. Uh, there, there may have been some um, macro level reporting as far as this block got kind of this percentage. We're able to tell customers, well, it's within this, uh, you know, these are where these species went, these are where these species went within a meter to two meters. And so we can do sites, uh, we always recommend, because we work in post wildfire, we always recommend to our land managers, uh, multiple species or a polyculture as opposed to a monoculture, because a polyculture, uh, different species have different evolved mechanisms to deal with fire. And the last thing you want after having a big burned acreage is to plant a whole bunch of trees that will reburn. So uh, it's very important that um, we recommend that and say, here's the species. And by the way, we collect all the seed so we can work with geographically appropriate seed uh, that's native. Um, and that's really important. And it goes far beyond just like, was it, an, you know, is it, is it native? Uh, we go down to kind of the seed zones uh, and seed zones are about the size of counties. And so those that we approach um, which seed to utilize because seeds from the closest seed zones will perform better, grow better, have a higher survival rate. And so it's really important for foresters to get that level of feedback. 
Now, then the follow-up is that we're absolutely looking at the data after one dry season. So for um, the summer season, desiccation drying out, that's what I mentioned, is one of the number one things that kills seeds. So go back out after the summer and see, well, how are we looking? Um, and then for carbon credit projects, uh, we're working on carbon credit futures or ex ante under climate action reserve. So these credits, uh, they absolutely require a third party independent forester um, to go out after a year, make sure that there's a minimum quantity of uh, trees on the landscape, uh, that they're spaced, that they're the right density, et cetera. Um, and that's how they then issue credits. Uh, and that comes a year later. So climate action reserve, very similar to folks who are familiar with U.S. Green Building Council, they're a standards organization. They create a standard. People follow them. They follow them. In U.S. Green Building Council's case, you get the big seal on the side of the building. In CAR's case, you get to issue credits onto their exchange a year after the project has been uh, initiated. So we're in our first project there. And for folks that are um, being affected by fire, uh, we're actively taking uh, solicitations, proposals for people to uh, get in touch with us about, hey, do they... Where do they need? What do they need? Seed seedlings, uh, enhanced aerial seeding, or finance? And that's that last bit, which is that finance. That's where the money comes from. Fabulous. So, um, in terms of the, uh, um, the the desiccation problem, number one is uh, how how soon after a wildfire can you plant? Um, you have to wait. You have to wait for you know, for example, some rain. You have to wait for. Uh, the soil to somehow be conditioned naturally before you can drop seed on it? Um, or can you go right away? What's the timing on that? We want to get in there as fast as possible. So we are reviewing and watching fires as they are burning and seeing where they expand to. And the reason for that is because the faster that we can get in there and stabilize soils, um, the the, the faster we can get in there before weeds start to pop up, the higher the establishment rate. So uh, a site after a year, two years, three years really starts to, I mean, nature doesn't like a vacuum. So things start to pop up. Um, and if they're, uh, and ideally we're out there within 90 days after a burn. Um, mm -hmm. And that's our, that's our focus. This hasn't been something that's been available in forestry before. So we're still uh, educating land managers, our customers to say, look, like you didn't know it, but like we can be out there within 90 days. Talk to us, tell us about your land, tell us, tell us what species you're looking for, give us some coordinates on where it's at or an address or which fire you were affected by. And the, the reason this is so impactful was because previously there was a really long supply chain to uh, get out and get seedlings after a fire. If you have a fire, well, first thing you gotta do is figure out, well, uh, who has seed for me? Uh, second is, well, do I have the money or do I need to go get a grant from Calair or from somebody else along those lines? And then you send the seed off to the nursery if the nursery has capacity. Right now, capacity is there's three-year waits with many nurseries just to start growing. Um, and then after that, you've grown it for a year. Well, then you've got to hire a subcontractor who hires the labor to do some of that manual planting with those uh, one- or two-year-old trees. And you do that because it is absolutely grueling work. The reason we utilize drones and are building that automation out, that pool for, for the workforce that goes out in the field is because if you're doing wind sprints up and down mountains with a 40 pound bag of one to two year old trees, you burn the caloric equivalent of running two marathons every day at work. <laughs> so what tree, what tree planters eat, like put, you know, is right up there with Michael Phelps, like seven pancakes with, you know, you've got your peanut butter, your honey, uh, you're just basically trying to figure out how to consume calories to keep yourself going during the day. And the uh, tree planters are superheroes out there. <laughs> and they're like the, uh, the firefighters who fight the wildfires in the first place, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, uh, <clears throat> you know, Grant, I, I wanted to ask you about uh, floods and droughts. I mean, we do have climate mm -hmm. change. And uh, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to find that you're addressing that directly. Uh, and I frankly think the media ought to be direct, you know, directly addressing it all day long um, to try to connect um, you know, climate change with what's happening. Sometimes uh, you hear it very flat reporting and say, oh, we have the wildfire, you know, oh, we have the, the drought or the flood. And they never even mention it's part of uh, climate change. Anyway, so if, if I have a wildfire, it's because largely because things were dry in the first place. And uh, I may have drought or flood after that. And so how can you deal, for example, 
with growing a forest in a very dry area, which is getting drier um, or which is being flooded? Uh, how, how, do you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, so first of all, thanks for the, to the, uh, the note there, like uh, for the audience. If you, see, if you see climate reporters or reporters on weather and, and disasters, and they're saying, uh, hey, the, this is a result of climate change, please send them a thanks because that is not happening enough. And uh, there's some networks that are, that are mentioning it. There's three that are not. And uh, the mentions of climate change with hurricanes and fires is just not there. Um, but this is the macro problem we sit in, we sit in which is a drone seed. We, we, we've been building for five years on this. The data has been there. This was before we, we existed in, and got started in 2016. 2018's fire, se fire season with Paradise Fire had not hit yet. Um, 2020, 2021, worse and worse. The data is, is that we will expect to see bigger fires that are more severe and we will see less and less natural regeneration. So people know this intuitively. They're not surprised to hear, oh, forests are in trouble. They're like glaciers. They're like coral, that they, we are starting to see the data that's coming back saying that they are in exponential decline. The no why behind it is what people don't have, which is that when there is a big fire that goes through, if it goes through at low severity, there, uh, there are cones at the top of the trees and there's seed in the soil that doesn't get burned. This fire kind of goes through and it's like a crumb brulee. There's like a nice little ash cap across the top uh, and the seeds in the soil are okay, but it's only like, you know, a centimeter, an inch down that the fire burns. And the trees only burn kind of the middle bushy part of the tree, but the top part of the tree, there's some cones and they'll have a seed rain and it comes down. That's a low severity fire. That's why prescribed burning is a great process in which we can reduce fire risk. Um, but what happens with moderate to high severity fires is that it burns all the way up to the top of the tree. So it makes it look like a Looney Tunes be hit by a, like a bolt of lightning. There's nothing left of that tree, uh, including some of that seed that was actually in uh, the tree waiting for fire events. And it burns several inches down into the soil. That's those big black plumes of smoke you see coming out from fires is a lot of that organic biomass going up. Um, and so what happens out of, out of that is if you've got a, a many, many more moderate to high severity fires because the dry period has stretched out from a couple of months to five or six months. The trees have lost all their moisture, the fuel loads are higher, and so they're more likely to burn. And then you see the, a, a increase in the frequency of lightning um, as a result of higher temperatures. So you're seeing that's one of the biggest effects that starts the fire. So this all happens, and what we see is that basically the forests are not regenerating. So we have to update our high school bio where, oh, that's sad, the forests will take a long time to regrow. No, the forests, in many cases, they were, they were regrowing 91% of the time. Now we're starting to see that drop down to potentially 60%, maybe 40%, depending upon the ecosystem. And we have a supply chain with orchards and seed that was built to resupply 9% of the system. Well, there is a lot more of that system that has not been built out, and it takes 20 to 40 years to spin up a new orchard. So we can't utilize the systems that exist in the past, which is one of the reasons that Silva Seed is such a critical focus point for us now, which is that we need to go out and collect uh, seed cones in those bushels and process them through Silva Seed to be able to make sure that we have uh, seed for seedlings, seed for aerial enhanced seeding, um, and then that's what really allows us to be able to reforest in a significant way after these massive fire events that we see every year. Um, and, that's, and that is where we can build that capacity. So there's, there's hope we can do that, but we have to invest a hell of a lot of money into doing that. And that's where the carbon credits come in um, because we're able to be able to basically take uh, companies that are making carbon neutral and negative pledges. Uh, and then there's not enough credits in the system for them to be able to make those pledges and expand. And so we're looking at that and saying, okay, well, forward-looking credits or the capture of carbon over time where there is legal easements put on the property, um, which guarantees that there will be that capture, um, that is how we look to accomplish that. So very long answer there. But, uh, oh, no, I love it. I love it all. <laughs> so what, what if the carbon credits are not available everywhere? What states are you operating in which actually have carbon credits, which provide a yep. benefit to, to the uh, landowner? Well, so California's uh, carbon credit market's been going strong. I'll distinguish here that we operate within the voluntary credits. So there's no need to have a market per se 
that requires you. Any company can go out there and say, look, let's assess what our carbon footprint is and then start looking at what are options. Um, and so the markets that are out there, the voluntary market, there's an exchange through climate action reserve that can be utilized today um, by anyone in any state. But the markets as a whole are starting to expand and emerge. Um, it is a very, very large uh, business. About 272 billion was, I think, the Refinitiv's uh, last analysis of carbon credits. That was vast majority was that is it was in the EU, but that is expanding. California's carbon market has been going strong for over a decade. It learned from Kyoto Protocol, put a price floor on carbon, um, and then Washington just passed a carbon market uh, this year, and then. Um, Canada just won a two-year court fight. The federal government has the authority, it was what it was ruled, to establish a national carbon market. And then Oregon has had the vote in the state legislature to be able to pass a carbon market um, for well on a year plus now, but they haven't had quorum or this, this, the sufficient number of members in the Senate to be able to actually pass the market. Um, so I think it's very similar to what we see with the legalization of cannabis. Uh, the states that uh, were the first movers there are starting to be the first movers to adopt uh, carbon markets. Now, and you would be a good reason for a given state to adopt uh, carbon credits because you're, you know, you're tangible, visible, um, and you have metrics. You can determine, uh, they can determine what you put in and how well it worked. Uh, speaking, mm -hmm. speaking of how well it works, do you ever have to go back later and say, hmm, that didn't work so well? Uh, we followed up and we found that uh, it, it wasn't growing at the same rate or covering the same ground in the, in the way we had hoped. Uh, so we're going to do it again. Does that ever happen? Oh, yeah. Uh, there, it's a probability game, which is that you're looking at how do we boost the probability for, for folks that are, it's a binary of like, oh, the trees grew or the tree didn't. Uh, that's not how it works. Uh, you're like, how can we get the right number of trees onto the onto the land. So in our R and D projects, um, yeah, we definitely have misses, um, and those come about. If it, it's hard for whether it's seedlings or seed to survive a heat dome, um, that is a big uh, you know that drying out is tough to work through. And so, uh, like any agriculture, weather plays a factor. Uh, so we what we look at is, is how do we mitigate those risks. So in our carbon credit projects. We work in big ways to mitigate those risks, have multiple phases to the project. So they're in the spring, they're in the fall, they can be multi-year. Um, and then the methodology itself, you better believe they put in a bunch of uh, protocols in place of how do we deal with fire risk? Uh, what if a project that's several, several years old burns again? Oh, there's, a, there's an insurance pool of the credits and those credits are retired. It is a trustworthy system where you can look at it and say, okay, there's a number of methodologies for different, uh, from everything from soil carbon to reforestation to uh, rangelands, et cetera. Well, they've come up with protocols and how do we deal with the risk? Well, the same way the insurance industry deals with it, which is all projects contribute into a risk pool. The project gets hit, the credits from that risk pool are retired accordingly. Um, and so that's kind of some of the, the factors there. And then having third parties that go out and verify allows people to say, oh, okay, yes, there was somebody, they were not the company, they went out there, they actually physically looked at uh, the, the trees that are growing. And then we we're actually starting to see technological advances in, to be able to reduce the cost of that. Well, once the trees get to be a certain age, you can start to see them on satellite images and you can start to reduce the cost of that. So there's companies like the Chama and others that are doing great work in that space. Oh, wow, this is science and technology and data gathering. It's it's really more sophisticated than I would have imagined. What about the species? You know, you 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 said a lot of things that make me feel that the species counts. Uh, sometimes you want one species, uh, or the customer does. Sometimes you want another. Sometimes a given species species will do better uh, in in fire, weather, uh, drought, flood, what have you. And sometimes uh, you want a certain species for the the natural uh, ecology of it. How do you choose the species? And is it a negotiating arrangement between you and the customer? Do you always agree? Um, so we make a recommendation. It's always, um, it's always like, what are the land manager's uh, priorities? Uh, that is where the, the focus is. Um, but what that means for us is that if you're a timber company, you don't want to see it burn again. I mean, those are, that is where the conversation like this usually heads. You don't want to see it burn again. You want to utilize species that are going to grow grow well. Um, for our carbon credit projects, 
um, the, the projects that we were doing are put under conservation easement. So that um, ceases to be timberland um, when we do those projects under perpetual easement. Um, so in that case, we're our first project, we've got nine species in total. Um, there are various uh, conifers. And so basically out of those projects, um, what happens is we start to uh, create a lot more uh, biodiversity that's on those stands, et cetera. Um, even though uh, timber companies, again, I'll mention like what their focus is when, when there's projects and they're looking to reforest quickly and, and similarly to like capture that carbon, um, what they're focused on is also mitigating the, big, the biggest risk to their business, which is fire. And so there's species that are native, that are ponderosa pine, that has a bark, kind of like a crush bumper on a car. And what, what happens out of that is it's designed to burn a little bit and still allow the tree to live. So that's a, that's a desirable species from both a commercial standpoint, as well as from a fire resiliency standpoint. And then you start to mix that in. I mentioned kind of that bushy middle section, depending upon our species that, as far as the, the kind of what the ladder is, how fire moves up the height of a tree, where it starts to factor some of those aspects in, as well as just kind of what are the other evolutionary mechanisms that, tr that tree species has. But Culture is a way to defend against fire because trees respond differently. Um, and then selection of trees, there's a nice overlap between what is commercial, what is fire resistant. Uh, and uh, that's, that's, where, that's how we make recommendations for our customers. Strikes me that you must be a, an agriculture scientist or well-trained in it, and or maybe you have agriculture scientists on your staff and, and or that you consult with them on a regular basis to refer, refine your you know, decision process and refine your systems. Am I right? Absolutely. Um, I, I myself have a great team surrounding me. Um, and so my, my job here is to basically integrate, uh, give direction and uh, take what is a multi multiple discipline approach for a company. Uh, and we've got folks that are coming out of the military, have a ton of experience uh, operating aircraft, specifically large aircraft that are remote and autonomous. We've got folks that are coming from PhDs in silviculture, uh, mass masters in post-fire ecology. Uh, we've got folks that are coming from the largest nurseries on the West Coast uh, and assisting us in building out our operations. And these are folks that we've all recruited on the basis of mission. And the company's mission is to make reforestation scalable and mitigate the worst effects of climate change. It doesn't believe, that doesn't mean the trees are the silver bullet to things. What it means is that we are interdependent. And if we lose all of our forests, that's going to be a massive gigaton dump of carbon. So we should do everything in our power to maintain our forests, reforest as fast as possible each and every year, and try and buy more time for all the other technologies, whether it's working on cow burps or direct air carbon capture or seaweed, everyone in tech working on climate is interdependent. And if we're not putting a price on carbon, decarbonizing, uh, electrifying everything, we are just going to face a far more negative future, not for our, just for our kids, but for ourselves. By the time I'm 60 at this trajectory, like my golden years are not gonna be fun. And everybody should be thinking accordingly to that which is that like uh, where we're headed on the trend lines with climate change, we very, very much need to uh, focus very large amounts of effort, people's time. If people aren't working on climate, um, there are so many opportunities to figure out how to transition, how you spend your eight hours a day working on climate. I highly encourage you to take a look at this. Absolutely. Uh, one, thing we, uh, one thing before we run out of time is, uh, uh, you know, uh, drones uh, have only been around for what, maybe 15 years, maybe something like that, uh, maybe 20 max. And um, you, you must be uh, um, refining your systems, uh, refining your equipment, refining uh, how you use the equipment. And of course, the, you know, the communications and control aspects of what you do. Can you describe briefly what the ARC has been? Uh, how have you developed, say, over the past 10 years? Uh, in terms of, um, you know, um, your, uh, your drone equipment. Yeah. So we, we got started in 2016, we went through Techstar Seattle, and it was right uh, kind of at the tail end of like the very large investments in the VC space in drones. And it, it was a, 
it was a we with a lot of investments. Oh, and then as we see, like sometimes there's that sort of valley of death for startups where it's sort of like great, the expectations were way higher than the technology can deliver. We've been building on that over five years. Um, it has continued to be a platform in which drones navigate terrain, navigate terrain faster than running wind sprints up and down with 40 pound payloads. Um, forestry, when we started uh, working with various land managers, uh, many would expect, okay, like forestry, like people may be concerned about the drones or like suspect of them, or we had the opposite experience. We were, many people were like, we wondered when you were going to get here. So there was a definite like, we're on board. We're looking forward to not running wind sprints and providing better tools for people. Like we don't plow fields with oxen and draft animals anymore. We have tractors. And so we're looking for those tools when we still have farmers. So we're looking for those tools to be able to be more efficient in what we do each and every day. And that's where drones come in. So we've been continuing to build bigger and better payload delivery systems. And at the time that we came up, um, there was really only consumer and military. Those were the sort of two buckets of uh, kind of where drones were at. And the consumer's not built for a thousand uh, assemblies and disassemblies when we take it out to site per season. Uh, so we built our own, which sort of made them far more resilient. That's where we've been a focus. As we start to see the drone industry mature further and further, we're starting to see some exciting technology that will then add our software to, to be able to have longer uh, flight times and bigger payloads. So we're pretty excited about that, as well as having the operating um, experience and trust with the FAA to be able to uh, operate in the, in the, with swarms in remote locations. Wow, what a great idea. Build your own. Stay ahead of the curve, always. You know, <clears throat> and, and deforestation is happening around the world. And uh, you must have, uh, you know, a better handle on this. But my, my guess would be is that um, deforestation is, is the most uh, dangerous uh, vector leading to climate change because of the amount of acreage that's being destroyed every day. Uh, and in many countries, I'm thinking Brazil, in many countries, it happens without limitation. And it happens uh, when the government turns a blind eye and people are you know, wrecking thousands and thousands of acres of forest all day long. And so it seems to me that uh, what you're doing and you know, the future of what you're doing uh, is, is probably one of the most salient efforts the world can make, that is to reforest. And so, of course, I, uh, you know, it goes without saying that your operation, uh, the need for it will expand, your operation will fill that need. But my question is, what do you see for drone seed now that it has acquired silver seed, now that it has developed this technology, now that it has uh, you know, looked so far and wide for better ways to do things? Uh, what do you see for the future of drone seed here and elsewhere out of the country in places where you know, there's an abiding need to reforest right now? Yeah, um, that reforestation need is something that people understand. Uh, we're hardwired biologically to appreciate and love trees from wherever, whatever ecosystem we're coming from. Um, it is something that it, it's been sustaining for us as we've evolved uh, through the centuries. So for us, uh, basically what we see is for today, um, what we're focusing on is expanding our footprint west of Colorado and into Hawaii. Um, and we have projects that are in the R&D phase there and looking to expand how we utilize uh, carbon capture and how we utilize carbon credits to be able to fund that reforestation and take it from a compliance cost of, yes, we'd like the trees to grow, but everybody would like to be pay as little as possible to, no, these are the highest quality credits you can get. Um, they've been verified. The, here's the native species. Uh, here's the locale, et cetera. Um, and so that's really where we're taking that. Over time, as we expand, uh, what we'll start to see is start to see operations that are focusing on where is that seed supply, fo focusing on uh, how do we operate with uh, locals. I've lived 25% of my life abroad in uh, four separate continents. And the answer is not uh, parade in as the Americans to be like, we've got this problem solved. The answer is to come in and basically say, like, look, let's talk to let's talk to folks that are managing land today, figure out what their objectives are and how we can provide technology and capital to work with and be able to boost those objectives of reforest faster. 
Um, and so that's something that as far as a, an approach that we come at it um, with uh, from a company perspective, that's similarly something that we'll be looking at uh, as, as we grow and expand. But first and foremost, uh, we have a huge problem with wildfires today in California and Oregon and Washington, um, all the way up into BC. And um, that is not isolated as are where the big media fires are. There are five to 10 other fires of similar size that are just not affecting structures. They're not affecting livestock and other pieces. They're remoter areas. They're just not getting the coverage. So um, that's something that we, I see a weekly report and you start to see here's 10 to 20,000 acres added to this fire. And I've got, a, we've got a list of right now, I think 10 to 15 right now we're tracking and starting to sort of watch the spotting as it's growing. So it's something that take care of where we're at today uh, first and foremost, uh, expand rapidly uh, with the with Silvestine uh, nursery operations in each of those four verticals that make us that vertically integrated company. Grant, uh, one one last um, scenario and one last uh, request for comment. When a, a place is uh, deforested, <clears throat> whether by burning or any any other way, uh, the wildlife that lived in that forest has to go somewhere else. And when it goes somewhere else, you you have the risk of um, you have the risk of it uh, uh, you know uh, coming into human inhabited uh, areas, and sometimes bringing disease with it called spillover disease. And uh, you know there are many scientists who believe that's exactly how SARS and MERS uh, and COVID uh, were originally generated. That um, bats, for example, that lived in forests uh, uh, had no forest anymore. And they had to move, and they moved closer to humans, and they brought with them their viruses. Um, so the question I put to you is, uh, you know, you can build a new forest, you can grow new trees, but how do you reattract the wildlife that was there before? Yeah, um, by, by creating habitat. Uh, once habitat is created, uh, you start to see, and this is, uh, you know, my background is coming from more of the uh, uh, the the conifers and the silviculture side of things, um, but there's a number of cases from other disciplines where you start to you know you reintroduce wolves or you reintroduce a keystone species, um, or the keystone species comes to the site because there is habitat, aka there's food, um, and so uh, you know to use a human metaphor. Like if you put food out, people will eat it. Well, you put food out, we you know we find that that's one of our biggest obstacles. We put seed out. Uh, how do we reduce that predation? Um, and so that we can get those trees to come back, provide that habitat and create more food for uh, in the form of cones and uh, seed. And so that's something that uh, you start to see some of those first species come back that attracts the other species. And then that's how you really rebuild over time. I mean, that is something that we see as our, our key function, which is how do we restore forests each and every year faster so that those, uh, so that animals ha have that habitat, and then we put it under a carbon credit easement. It's burned ground. We reestablish those trees. That land now has a legal conservation status, um, and that is habitat for animals. And if we do it right, we do it with polycul polyculture. Um, we talk to those land managers. We convince them, hey, this is the right way to resist fire. This is the right way to be able to establish. Um, that is something that's very, you know, impactful for attracting uh, additional species is that polyculture uh, out in the environment. Grant, I'm, I'm so glad we ran into each other. I'm so glad you came on our show. It's so important to talk to you, appreciate you, admire you for what you're doing. Uh, we, will, we will follow you because we know, you know, you're, you're going places, not only in terms of the business aspect, but in terms of uh, dealing with climate change, you're an important factor. And uh, I'm so delighted you were here today. Thank you so much, Grant Canary, CEO of Drone Seed.